Well, good afternoon, uh, Your Excellencies, uh, Ministers, ladies and gentlemen. My name is John Chipman, and I'm the Director General and Chief Executive of the International Institute for Strategic Studies in London, and I've been asked to make a 10-minute presentation to set the scene for this panel that is entitled Pacific No More, Security in East Asia and the Korean uh, Peninsula. Amid an increasingly contested geopolitical space, I think it's right to present some of the pertinent defense and military facts that shape strategic geopolitical issues in Asia, including relations with external security providers. At the IISS, that is our task each day. And with our new online Military Balance Plus database, the world policy community is now able instantly to query our data and conduct sophisticated analysis of military developments virtually as they unfold. States across the Asia Pacific are improving their armed forces. The development of conventional military capabilities is sustained by continued tensions in the East China and South China Seas, as well as on the Korean Peninsula. Across the region, procurements are fueled by growing military budgets. The balance of global military spending continues to shift towards Asia, as our first slide on defense spending indicates. IISS data shows that after overtaking Europe as the second largest defense spending region in 2012, Asia in 2016 spent 1.3 times more than Europe on defense when measured in constant 2010 US dollars. China spends the most in the region. Its official defense budget is 1.8 times higher than the combined budgets of South Korea and Japan and 3.7 times higher than other states surrounding the South China Sea put together. Some of the military capabilities now seen in the region are challenging Western military technological superiority. We judge that in some capability areas, particularly in the air domain, China appears to be reaching near parity with the West. China's progress in military research and development taken together with its improved military capabilities mean that it is now the single most important driver for US military technical developments. This year's military balance assesses that China's Air Force has just introduced into service a highly capable short range missile that only a handful of leading aerospace nations are able to develop. And we show this in slide two on air to air missiles. The introduction of this weapon called the PL-10 reflects the sustained and continuing investment China is making in air-launched guided weapons. Beijing will almost certainly be able to add increasingly capable air-to-air -air weapons to its inventory in the next few years. The Navy is also developing. Work has started on building three Type 055 cruisers and at least 13 Type 052D multi-mission destroyers are in service or under construction. A growing number of China's modern surface combatants are being fitted with phased array radars. For China's armed forces, integrating these new military systems will in time deliver new capabilities, but will also bring challenges, including in terms of new doctrine, training, and personnel. China has already started to make its military training more realistic and more joint. The United States, meanwhile, is looking to address this increased challenge to its long-established military dominance by more often deploying its most modern military platforms to the region and more widely dispersing advanced weapon systems across its naval forces. Washington is also looking to maintain its military advantage by boosting innovation and leveraging the US civilian high-tech sector. In Northeast Asia, North Korea's nuclear and missile programs continue to concern the region's capitals. In 2016, North Korea conducted 24 missile tests, one satellite launch, and two nuclear tests. And this is referred to in slide three on North Korea's missile tests. Most of the tests so far 
have been of short and intermediate range ballistic missiles which threaten principally South Korea and Japan. The North's stated plan to develop an ICBM capability is of particular concern, not least given Pyongyang's rhetoric towards the United States and its drive to develop a nuclear capability for its ballistic missile. Ground tests of the presumed first stage engines for a road mobile ICBM and a prospective heat shield for a re-entry vehicle have been observed. Development of the road mobile KN08 ICBM has been confirmed by US officials. The test on 12 February 2017 of what appeared to be a land-based variant of its KN-11 submarine launched missile showed further technical advances. A solid fueled motor, which would allow for a quick launch and a tracked launch vehicle, which by giving off-road mobility makes the missile harder to detect and preempt. In response, regional states have looked to boost their missile defense capabilities and the US last year announced that the Theater High Altitude Area Defense System, or THAAD, would be deployed to South Korea. However, the THAAD deployment in South Korea is a necessary, but not sufficient defense against North Korea's shorter range missile systems, nor is it effective, of course, against an ICBM. Better coordinating regional missile defense would be a way to more efficiently address the North missile challenge. And 2016 saw Japan, South Korea and the US conduct a trilateral missile defense drill exercise Pacific Dragon. But developing effective defense cooperation means aligning not only capabilities and threat perceptions, but also of course tackling historic antipathies between the two regional powers. Tensions also persist in the South China Sea. China has established military facilities on at least six of the features it occupies in the Spratly Islands. Mischief Reef and Fari Cross Reef each have a three kilometer runway that could be used by combat aircraft. Other nations too have built facilities in this area as we show in slide four that shows airstrips in the Spratly Islands. One important consequence of China's activities in the South China Sea has been the decision by the United States Navy to undertake so-called freedom of navigation operational patrols designed to assert the right of the US and others to fly and sail wherever it was legally permitted. Various countries in Southeast Asia are having to decide whether they support or contribute to this activity in similar defense of an international legal principle. Across the region more broadly, others strengthened their military capabilities. Military aerospace capabilities are modernizing and countries are buying more advanced combat aircraft, maritime patrol, and anti-submarine warfare aircraft. Submarines have proliferated in the region. Our data for 2016 shows 214 submarines in regional inventories compared to 174 in 1990. Every other region in the world, apart from the Middle East, saw numbers of submarines decline. In the Asia Pacific, more of these boats have air independent propulsion, enabling greater underwater range. The region is also seeing more and larger vessels for Coast Guard forces and more naval surface warfare capacity. China is leading the way but is by no means alone in building larger, more heavily armed naval vessels, as we show in the next slide, describing cruisers over nine and a half thousand tons. Japan and the Republic of Korea are also doing so. Outside the United States, Asian states are now the only nations building destroyers and cruisers in the nine and a half thousand to 10,000 ton range. The size of these ships implies an increasing capacity to deploy maritime capabilities over greater range and in more extreme weather conditions through the year. They also indicate a greater potential to embark more advanced missile systems like high-powered radars. The potential for friction is increasing across all domains. 
but particularly at sea and in the air. How the region's military modernization is managed will, in tandem with measures to tackle enduring security crises, help shape the future security environment in the region. For that reason, we all look forward to intense defense and diplomatic exchanges at the IISS Shangri-La Dialogue from 2 to 4 June 2017 that will be opened by Australian Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull. But here, I leave you now in the capable hands of Kevin Rudd, the first Australian Prime Minister to deliver an address at the Shangri-La Dialogue. Kevin, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, John Chipman. And uh, for the work also of IISS, and Shangri-La, as you know, has become an extraordinary gathering place for the region's national security community um, across uh, East Asia and beyond. Uh, also, the military balance, uh, John, in its new form is a terrific document and a ter terrific resource for us all. And thank you for the work there. Uh, thank you also to Munich uh, Security Conference for bringing Asia to the agenda uh, as it's done over several years now. And this is important in terms of any balanced global consideration of the security challenges facing us at all. Now, the format we have uh, is pretty straightforward this afternoon, while the questions are not straightforward. Um, but the format is along these lines. I will seek to make a few remarks myself in terms of key pressure points within the region. Uh, I'll then turn to each of our distinguished panellists here, who I'll introduce in sequence. Uh, and then we're going to throw it open to a, a genuine dialogue. And we can roll through uh, for as long as we like until the dinner gong sounds at seven. Um, and if we lose interest before then, uh, then the Australian ambassador up there said to me she's hosting drinks up the back. Uh, she didn't know about that at all. A few remarks about uh, the year ahead. Uh, and uh, in a piece I wrote recently coming out of a uh, security conference in uh, New Delhi, I was thinking about the challenges uh, of the year ahead, which I see and describe then as the year of living dangerously, 2017. There's too much going on simultaneously, not just globally, but within our region as well. And so the challenge for diplomacy in managing each of these challenges and keeping the pressure points low uh, and the tension levels lower uh, will be acute uh, for the uh, experienced uh, ministers uh, who are on this panel, uh, which we will hear from soon. But if you go through the list, uh, as I will in uh, a couple of minutes straight, uh, big challenge in terms of uncertainty is purely the question of the future direction of US policy. It is an uncertain factor. We look at President Trump, we hear his statements, we see some of his actions, we can make a judgment about where his deep policy impulses lie and his deep policy convictions, but we have no idea how this is going to be translated into policy in so many areas. So we now find the United States actually being a factor of uncertainty in our own region, which has multiple implications one way or the other. And I'm sure we'll hear from uh, Senator Sullivan uh, on that question soon. And it's more a question of not knowing rather than a reaction to particular positions that I think is the challenge which confronts many of us in, as regional countries. Second, and following from that, of course, is US-China. We have seen the statements on Taiwan. We've seen now the walking back from those statements on the One China policy. And this is good for regional stability. If ever there was something which had a grave risk of undermining the, uh, the fundamentals of uh, regional peace and stability in East Asia, it was throwing the One China policy onto the negotiating table. Now that's been corrected by the President himself, and now the rest of that agenda is complex and challenging bilaterally between the two. And as John has just indicated, if you go through the list where China and the US are engaged, it's a formidable list. Number three, what will US-Russia normalization or non-normalization mean in our strategic hemisphere in Asia? An open question, and there are sub-ramifications of that, not least of which is uh, Russia's continuing negotiations with Japan on the future of the islands to the north. And then we have US-Japan-Korea, recent visit by um, Defence Secretary Mattis, uh, well received in both countries, as, as I understand, um, but also on the back of challenging statements made by then-candidate Trump in the lead-up to the elections about the future of the security links between the two. Uh, 
Um, we then have the classic areas, which of course uh, John Chipman ran through, the East China Sea, we're familiar with Sankoku Diaodao and the history of the dispute and where it will go. Uh, we have the South China Sea, which has been the particular subject of commentary by uh, President Trump uh, since uh, being sworn in and in the transition period as well. And what will that now mean in terms of rules of engagement by the Chinese Navy and by the United States Navy, and particularly will PACOM play the, the game as it's historically played, or will Admiral Harry Harris have a different view in terms of how ships on the high on the seas in the South China Sea, and aircraft in the air will now behave. On top of that again, uh, we have not a classic security question, but we have what is now preoccupying the chanceries across our region, which is the future of regional trade. Historically a factor which has brought, brought our region together, despite its multiply different political traditions, uh, but now with the death of the Trans-Pacific Partnership and an uncertainty about what will replace it, if anything, uh, and the looming question of could there, end, could there be a trade war between the United States and China, what does that do in terms of surrounding political sentiment underpinning the region? But then we get to the granddaddy of them all, and I put that last on my list of ten, which is North Korea. We know what's happened in the last 12 months, it's been formidable. John indicated before, some 24 tests uh, of missiles in the year 2016, a record number, Two nuclear tests themselves, uh, again, the first time we've had two tests in a single year. And the last of those tests, toward the end of last year, was the largest on record. And I'll be interested to have a technical analysis from the Sina Serbo, from the, from the CTBO, uh, when it comes his turn to speak. But this one, North Korea, involving, I've got to say, so many of the speakers who are on our panel today but preoccupying national security policy establishments in so many Asian capitals uh, is uh, at front of mind in deliberations in Washington uh, and elsewhere across the region. And then underpinning the lot is what uh, John Chipman again ran through before, which is the regional arms bazaar, uh, which is now uh, Asia. Might be great for various uh, European arms manufacturers in terms of markets in East Asia, for the rest of us who live there, it poses a whole new generation of challenges. You may or may not know, but uh, Asia for the first time last year spent more on its combined military expenditure than Europe. And so the graph will continue to move like that. So that's the, uh, the framework in which we find ourselves. These are the pressure points in what I've described as the year of living dangerously. And uh, what I'd now like to do is to invite our panel to make uh, some introductory remarks before we open it to a broader conversation. If I could uh, begin with uh, my good friend and former colleague Yun uh, byung se the Minister for Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Korea, a very experienced diplomat in our region. Over to you, Minister. Thank you, Thank you Kevin, for your wonderful introduction. Today's topic, Pacific No More, Security in East Asia and the Korean Peninsula couldn't be more timely and pertinent. In fact, waters in the Pacific are more turbulent than ever since the end of the Cold War. East Asia is undergoing a kind of tectonic shift with multiple daunting challenges erupting simultaneously, such as long-standing issues like territorial and historical conflicts emerging issues like maritime, cyber, and space security, fast-growing regional tensions among big powers. On top of that, there is the North Korean nuclear conundrum. It may look like a Pandora's box opening, and there seems to be a return of geopolitics and geoeconomics as well. So we are entering an era of transformation. How we navigate through our part of the world will decide whether we will sink in turbulent waters or ride the waves and reach the shores of our Pacific era. From my standpoint, the North Korean nuclear issue is the most imminent and gravest challenge. Let me elaborate why. As many uh, previous speakers said, last year alone, North Korea conducted two nuclear tests and 24 ballistic missile launches of all sorts. This means one launch every two weeks. North Korea is nearing the final stage of nuclear weaponization. 
In our analysis, the tipping point may be only a couple of years away. It's a ticking time bomb. Its missile capability is posing a direct threat to the world, including continental United States. The IRBM launch two weeks ago is surely a prelude to nuclear-capable ICBM. And North Korea's trigger-happy young leader has publicized his intention to actually use these weapons. So what does this mean? We are racing against time. If we do not reverse this process now, then this will become a game changer for all of us. It would be like living under Pyongyang's nuclear sword of Damocles, precariously dangling over our heads. No one is safe from, from it. Yesterday in Bonn, G20 foreign ministers had in-depth discussions on how to preserve and strengthen rules-based international order. And here, North Korea is a rule breaker par excellence. As I mentioned, it violated the UN Security Council resolutions at least 26 times in one single year last year. There's no parallel in the UN history. When North Korea was admitted to the UN in 1991, it pledged to abide by the UN Charter as a peace-loving state, but its track record clearly shows that it is nothing but a serial offender. Now it's time to act. We need to get serious. Fortunately, we are able to forge the strongest ever international unity and solidarity against North Korea last year. The UN Security Council unanimously adopted the toughest ever and the most comprehensive ever resolutions, 2270 and 2321, with China and Russia on board as well. This time, there are many evidences that our sanctions measures are working and biting. The annual cap on key mineral exports is expected to reduce hard currency income by at least 800 billion US dollars. There are other pressure points such as financial sanctions, transportation, overseas North Korean workers, and diplomatic isolation. Even Pyongyang is re referring to the Leningrad blockade and Cuban quarantine to describe the severity of the measures in place. However, even when we have established an unprecedented net framework of the entire international community versus North Korea, there are some who uh, may want to uh, rush back to dialogue with Pyongyang. Let me drop words of caution here. Over the past 20-something years, since the first North Korea nuclear crisis, we have left no stone unturned. Negotiations with North Korea have led us nowhere but back to scale one, like Sisyphus uh, in Greek mythology. The agreed framework of 1994, the September 19th Joint Statement of 2005, and Leave the D of 2012 are uh, salient cases in point. For all these reasons, dialogue for dialogue's sake with North Korea is simply buying the same horse again. At this stage, let me register that we are open to dialogue in principle, but our goal is not compromising on half measures or sanglance of denuclearization. Our objective is the CVID, complete, verifiable, and irreversible dismantlement of North Korean nuclear weapons programs, as was prescribed by UN Security Council resolutions. The ongoing international pressure for denuclearization of North Korea may be a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. Given the uniquely unique North Korean regime, our approach should not be confined to only denuclearization efforts. It should be more holistic, encompassing several elements such as human rights and information flow. As we discussed in Bonn, durable peace can be achieved only when human rights and development go hand in hand. Signs of human rights violation are often symptomatic, symptomatic of looming conflicts. During the past few years, we have witnessed a snowballing of awareness about North Korea's widespread systematic and grave human rights abuses, especially in the wake of the release of the UN Commission of Inquiry report in 2014. Some 140 high-level close associates of Kim's family were executed since the current leader came to power. 
is the most impoverished society where freedom and human dignity of its people are completely neglected. All these factors have prompted increasing number of defectors, which now reached a record high of 30,000, including the elite group. In the age of great accountability, the international community must put North Korea on notice that there will be no impunity for its wrongdoings. What we need to do now is to induce or, if necessary, force a wind of, force a wind of change within North Korea. Distinguished participants, if we achieve progress on our efforts towards denuclearization and on bringing a wind of change in North Korea, it will lead us to durable peace and ultimately reunification. Our vision of unified Korea is to serve as growth booster, peace promoter, and guardian of universal values. This great dream should start with the realization of a denuclearization on the peninsula. If we don't do it right, and if we don't do it now, nuclear tragedy can engulf not just East Asia, but the international community as a whole. But if we do right, we can overcome this biggest challenge and turn it into great opportunity. It will serve greater common good, not only for the Korean people, but also for the region and beyond. We count on your strong support in our journey. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Foreign Minister Yun. Tipping point within a couple of years, maybe. Uh, don't rush back to dialogue with the DPRK, um, though welcomed in principle. And of course, the underlying principle taken by Seoul is com and the UN Security Council resolutions is complete uh, and verifiable uh, elimination of nuclear weapons. Thank you so much for your contribution. Uh, Defence Minister Ng of um, Singapore. We always looked for Singapore for regional wisdom and back to the days of uh, Lee Kuan Yew. And I see uh, Defence Minister Ng belonging to the same tradition. Over to you, my friend. Chinese would say Guo Jiang. But, uh, which which means, by the way, in English, don't, don't uh, exaggerate too much. But uh. <laughs> Let me just thank uh, John Chipman and Chairman Kevin Rudd for giving us quite a a comprehensive and I think a very useful context, almost a yin and yang, one, the nuts and bolts, the mechanics of the increased militarization of Asia and one's issues uh, remarkably succinctly but uh, poignantly phrased. I intend just to restrict my remarks, brief remarks, to one central issue, which is the US-China relationship, which I believe that in terms of engagement with each other and with other ASEAN or Asian countries will be the key consideration for stability in the Asia Pacific region and in this regard, East Asia, Korean Peninsula and ASEAN. And I, I agree completely with uh, Kevin Rudd that with a new administration at the helm, it's particularly important at this juncture for both US and China to articulate there are overarching foreign policy objectives towards Asia. And I, need, I don't think there needs to be a reminder, everyone, but uh, President Trump said in his inauguration speech, quote, from this day forward, it's going to be only America first, America first. Every decision on trade, on taxes, on immigration, on foreign affairs will be made to benefit American workers and American families, unquote. Quite a different message if you may, from that of the US in 1961, a different inauguration, and this time at the start of the Cold War, from President John F. Kennedy, which proclaimed a US that would, quote, pay any price, bear any burden to assure the survival and the success of liberty. And particularly for ASEAN states, that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. Unquote. It was this American exceptionalism, the raison d'etre of US presence in the Asia Pacific region against the communist threat. It then provided common cause which, which countries could enjoin. As Dr. Kissinger wrote, it provided the quote unquote legitimacy for the expansion of US influence in Asia. But beyond the communist threat, 
The U.S. led the establishment of institutions that today form the fabric of globalization. The question we have to ask at this juncture, on what basis will the continued U.S. presence and influence be legitimized under an American first policy? If U.S. foreign policy de facto is predominantly anti-China, I think it will be a frustrating decade for many of us in ASEAN and Asia. Similarly for China, if its efforts are viewed as means to usurp the United States as the resident Pacific power, countries will de facto have to choose sides and be put into lose-win situations. If the US foreign policy is predicated on a transactional basis, i.e. US provides the security umbrella in exchange for trading privileges or commercial gains, and for China the reverse, Security considerations can be a barter for countries that need access to Chinese markets. Then I think the genesis of trading, even security blocks, has begun. That the US as a military power is able to continue its presence and influence in the Pacific is not in doubt. But this military prowess, while necessary, is insufficient for continued stability and progress in Asia. Similarly, China as a rising power has to articulate its inclusive vision for Asia and beyond. That vision will realistically serve China's interests, but not exclusively, and must also provide other countries the assurance of clear, common, and acceptable rules around which countries can evolve a new order. And I think some of the initiatives have started or are being developed. The One Belt, One Road initiative the ASEAN Infrastructure Investment Bank, the AIIB, and the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, initiatives which Singapore fully supports and will facilitate. And I think in these uncertain times, Mr. Chairman, existing platforms such as the ASEAN Regional Forum, the East Asia Summit, the ADMM Plus, will need to play productive roles to promote a better understanding with US, China, and other countries. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and again, good, sharp and distinct. Thank you so much, Defence Minister Ng. Uh, going to the question of um, a clear statement of US and Chinese interests in the region, going to the question of if the US presence becomes transactional and the subsequent Chinese presence becomes parallel transactional, then are we looking therefore already at the emergence of a combined set of trading and military blocks confronting for us all. Uh, but there are alternative ways through. If I can now turn to Madam Fu Ying, former Vice uh, Foreign Minister of China, former Ambassador to the United Kingdom, prior to that, Australia, where we first met, and certainly um, a distinguished member of the foreign policy establishment of the People's Republic of China. Ambassador Fu. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, after all these uh, very interesting and substantive uh, remarks, so uh, I hesitated whether I should go back to my prepared text or make comments. Probably safer to stay with my text and make comments later on. <laughs> uh, but before I start, I, I, I want to mention that uh, the Munich Security Report of 2017 is uh, quite impressive. The, the questions uh, raised with such a boldness and depth uh, and over the past uh, days, we've been trying to understand the answers to all those questions. Probably take longer for, for people to find the answers, but it's very interesting. And it's not irrelevant with uh, Asia Pacific either. I think uh, for, for us coming from afar, it's interesting to, to, to watch how the Europeans examine themselves, reflect on themselves. And uh, Professor John Chipman's uh, remarks make me uh, remind us how you, when you're examining Asia, you, you, you seem to look at things from another angle. Uh, for example, here, uh, the, yesterday, uh, the defense minister and today, the, 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 the other defense ministers and, and uh, prime ministers, they, they were all talking about how important it is for the NATO members to increase their their budget, uh, defense budget share to 2%. Uh, 
uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's necessary. Uh, it's, uh, it's one of the hot issues debated here. And when talking about Asia, uh, John Chipman, you, you sounds like you Asians are doing too much. <laughs> and uh, China has been keeping its uh, defense budget at 1.5% of its GDP all these years. And uh, I, I don't intend, I don't think our state council agrees to raise it to 2%. <laughs> One and a half percent is quite okay. But uh, every year uh, when, when we are having the Congress, I, I'm the sp spokesperson of the Congress, and uh, the first question to me at the P Congress uh, press uh, release is China's defense budget. And the next day you will read the front page stories how threatening China is. Uh, so I, I think uh, in today's world we are uh, more and more globalized and uh, gradually we, uh, I hope the standard will, will, will become a more, more, how do I say, unified. And uh, we could uh, uh, somehow look at each other through the same light and we are not enemies to each other. And uh, I also agree that uh, there should be very good uh, analysis of the defense uh, development and there'll be a good uh, explanation to each other why we're doing so and we should feel more comfortable about it. But as a Chinese, I think uh, I share the feeling of uh, many of us in China that we are proud that finally we can develop a strong uh, military to defend ourselves. And this country suffered so much in the past need to be able to stand on its own feet. And China's safety, China in peace, is a very much part of the peace and safety of the world. And talking about the Asia Pacific, I would think, uh, uh, I would see the security of Asia Pacific in two parts. First part is the 20-ish years after the Cold War, and the second part is the, the since then, up to this stage. In the, in the first 20 years, when, when the many parts of the world were in quite a chaotic situation, there were conflicts, there were even wars, Asia Pacific was relatively peaceful. Countries, uh, 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 as the phrase, phrase goes, uh, beat the uh, sword into plowshares, uh, and countries came together, um, overcame the difficulties and uh, went into uh, regional integration. An economy boomed. Uh, many countries in Asia, in Asia Pacific uh, have uh, grown very fast over the past, over those 20 years. And uh, <coughs> the, the disputes you mentioned uh, in the South China Sea wasn't, uh, uh, was there already at that time, but uh, the China and ASEAN countries and neighbors were able to reach an agreement to, to shelve the disputes and we worked out a DOC and uh, we, we managed it quite well. It wasn't a problem. And most of the journalists, if you recall, you were not reporting about problems in, in, Asia, in, in, in that region in those 20 years. But in the second part, there, the, I think in the past uh, less than a decade, tension seems to become more prominent. There is uh, more concern in the world about, uh, about the situation in this region. I would think uh, there are a number of reasons. Of course, uh, China has grown stronger. There is growing concern among the neighbors. And China should, uh, uh, China uh, could have uh, done a better job explaining to its neighbors and uh, making them feel more comfortable. Uh, and, uh, but there's also concern on the part of US about China maybe uh, uh, taking uh, kind of a, uh, taking, a, a competing with US for, for the regional priority, uh, the regional uh, leadership role. Uh, but from the Chinese point of view, there, is a growing, there was growing concern about U.S. Uh, re, uh, Asia Pacific rebalancing the pivot, uh, the concern that it was targeting at China. Uh, but the, 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 hand, the specific issues which really uh, made everybody nervous was the uh, tension over the South China Sea uh, territorial and maritime disputes. And for China, the concern is that uh, 
the, the disputes were there, and China were able to agree with the neighbors that we shelved them, but China never gave them up. But when there were uh, growing provocations in, especially like in Scarborough of 2012, U.S. openly sided with the dispute, the other disputing parties, and U.S. Uh, was uh, was kind of appearing to be a party to the dispute, and that made many in China very concerned, very concerned. So there was this. Uh, urge of, of uh, uh, kind of pushing of, of, of uh, calling for, for the government to be able to, to defend our interests, defend our sovereignty. But I think uh, after, after this period of uh, back and forth, the China and ASEAN countries have come back to the understanding that we should uh, uh, find a negotiated solution, we should move uh, Apart from uh, uh, Biden by DOC, we should move into negotiations into COC, which is making progress. Uh, I, I think uh, I think uh, the situation is coming down a bit, and I also hope there is a better understanding between China and the United States over uh, over these uh, regional issues. But generally speaking, in the final uh, at the at the heart of the debate about security in Asia Pacific, I think it's it's the question of uh, exclusive security or inclusive security. Uh, when there is the emphasis that there is a security of the allies, how about the non-allies? How about the security of those outside the alignment? Uh, and uh, uh, the the consensus, the I, the Asian way, which was uh, advocated by ASEAN countries, is that. The security should be common, should be, should be cooperative security, common security, and when everybody feels secure, then there is security. I think that uh, should uh, remain the, the, the security concept of the region, and President Xi Jinping also promoted strongly for cooperative security and common security. Uh, and uh, uh, only when, when the security of all parties are taken into consideration, uh, uh, then the region, then Pacific can be Pacific. Uh, that's uh, my, my thinking. Thank you. Thanks so much, um, Madam Fu. <laughs> China, 1.5% of GDP on defense. Nothing to worry about there. Uh, number two, South China Sea. Uh, China reacting to provocations from other parties uh, and other claimants, particularly from 2012. And three, uh, inclusive versus exclusive security. Thank you so much for your contribution. Um, I'd now turn to Senator Dan Sullivan, who's been in the United States Senate, he tells me, all of two years, uh, from the great state of Alaska. Uh, how, many, how many miles is Alaska from Russia? Four. Okay. <laughs> the, Depending uh, on where you are in Alaska and Russia. The, um, uh, and... Uh, Senator Sullivan, uh, during the period of the Bush administration, was the Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs. And so he has had a substantive professional engagement writ large across the uh, foreign economic policy uh, of uh, previous US administrations before his elevation to the Senate, where he now sits as a member of the um, Senate Armed Services Committee. Welcome, and it's good to have you here Thank with you. us. Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, and I thank all the panelists here, many of whom I've met before and have a lot of respect for. You know, I think uh, my remarks I wanted to touch on when you look at kind of where we're going and what the issues are, I think sometimes it's important to also look back and reflect on where we've been. And, um, you know, sometimes even Americans forget this, but the United States is clearly an Asia Pacific nation. We're here focusing on a lot of European issues, but we're clearly an Asia-Pacific nation. Uh, I was one of a small group of senators who had the opportunity to have breakfast last week with, uh, with uh, Prime Minister Abe, and I reminded him when I uh, was talking to him saying, my hometown of Anchorage, Alaska is actually closer to Tokyo than it is to Washington, D.C. So we're very much an Asia-Pacific nation, and states like mine are Asia-Pacific states. And I think it's important to, when you look at the past, where we have been, it's important to recognize since World War II, 
certainly the view from the United States, but I think most of our allies in the region and probably even some of the countries who are not our allies would recognize that for the past 70 years, the United States presence, um, our military, forward military presence, um, our security relationships, our economic relationships, our alliances in the region, um, our desire to have a strong Navy to keep sea lanes open has really helped all the nations in the Asia Pacific take advantage of opportunities and rise. So, uh, Madam Chair, you mentioned that there's been this uh, relative peace and prosperity in the region. We, would, we certainly agree with that, uh, but we believe a lot of that was due to the U.S. Uh, presence and the security presence that benefited pretty much everybody in the region, including China. So when you look at um, that issue as the backdrop, um, what does the future hold? Well, I believe, and I think not enough Americans, uh, in my view, focus on it, but the, uh, uh, as the defense minister mentioned, to me, the biggest geostrategic challenge issue that we in the United States should be focused on and will be, I think, for the long term, is the U.S.-China relationship, is the rise of China in the region and what that means for the for the entire region, what that means for the entire world. And I had an interesting kind of uh, coincidence of events. I was uh, getting ready. Again, I was uh, honored to, uh, to be uh, asked as a small group of uh, senators to meet with uh, President Xi Jinping when he came to Washington, D.C. in 2015. And I'd gone to the Senate floor and I talked about this issue that uh, Harvard professor Graham Allison has written about the what he calls the, what he's called the Thucydides trap, which when you look at the rise of a power historically, and he's talking about the Greek, uh, ancient Greek historian Thucydides, when Sparta, um, when Athens was challenging Sparta, it led to the Peloponnesian War. So he was looking at a study throughout history, what, what happens when there's a rising power that in many ways is challenging or coming uh, um, to power when there's an existing uh, a power in the region. And he talks about this issue as the Thucydides trap. So I gave a speech on this before I met with the, the president. And in the meeting, President Xi Jinping opened by talking about the Thucydides trap. <laughs> and we all agree that we need to avoid the trap. So I think that's a good thing. I think that's where we need to begin. And that is a meeting of the minds, uh, certainly among leaders in China and leaders in the United States. But what are the pr principles going forward? Well, I would suggest a few when we look at that relationship, but the broader relationship in Asia. First, um, our allies from the United States perspective are the linchpin of this security, whether it's Korea or Japan or Australia, we have very, very strong alliances. And although President Trump mentioned in his inauguration, America first, he also did mention the need to deepen our existing alliances and build new ones, which I fully agree with. So that is absolutely critical that the alliances that we've had that have brought so much security for decades to the region stay rock solid and um, can be even expanded. Second, I think we need to continue strong engagement with China. And there's been many different approaches to that, but if you look historically, during the Cold War and other periods, you know, the United States clearly had a strategy of containment with regard to the Soviet Union. But our strategy with China has never been focused on containment. It's always been focused on engagement whether it's the WTO, whether it's Bob Zellick talking about responsible stakeholder, whether it's Secretary of the Treasury Paulson uh, with Chinese leaders launching the strategic economic dialogue. And we need to continue that, even though sometimes that can be difficult. It's important, not just executive branch, but members of Congress and the parliament as well. 
And then finally, I would say, and this is a very important issue, it's more internal for the United States, is to reinvigorate what's going on in, in our country, particularly economically. So when America is engaging with the world from a perspective of strength and confidence, it's better for us, and I think it's better for the rest of the world. And what you've seen over the last decade, more than a decade, is a, is a lost decade of economic growth in the United States. We have not hit 3% GDP growth in a year in over 10 years. That is not typical American growth. And we need to reinvigorate what we have as a country because I think a strong America, militarily, yes, and we're gonna, re we're gonna rebuild our uh, military under President Trump. But particularly economically, I think is good for the region, I think it's good for our allies, I think it's good for the US-China relationship. And to me, that's one of the most important things we can be doing in the region uh, to have continued peace and prosperity going forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senator Sullivan. Um, and A strong defense of the argument that strategic stability in the Asia-Pacific is actually in the post-45 period hinged on a forward U.S. strategic presence, uh, a naval engagement in the high seas, keeping open the sea lines of communication, and an alliance structure, and those being the thematics for the future. Uh, also, Thucydides Trap, by the way, Graham Allison, good friend of many of us in this room. Uh, his book comes out in May this year. Uh, he's been working on it for years, so get your early copy. Don't worry, I have no shares in the publishing house, but it's going to be worth reading. And uh, I was up at Harvard the other day, and I'm still a senior fellow at Belfer. And um, Joe Nye, is Joe in the room? Uh, he's, I saw him rolling around the conference somewhere. Uh, Joe has written this great article on the Kindleberger Trap. Anyone know what the Kindleberger Trap is? Please put up your hand. Okay, I didn't know about it either until um, I read Joe's article. It's an essay which gets to the question of what happens when a great power withdraws from the provision of global public goods in security and no one else wants to step forward. <laughs> and the analogy, uh, friends, is uh, of course what happened with uh, Britain after the First World War, exhausted by the war effort, but a reluctant America to put its first step forward. And we know what happened with the troubled history of the 20s and 30s and where that ended. And, uh, and a reminder, um, Senator, also that the thematics of US engagement with China or relationship with China has not been containment, um, but one of continued engagement. So thank you for your comments. Lucina Serbo, um, the Executive Director of the Comprehensive Test Ban Organization. Most importantly, a graduate of an Australian university um, and uh, a first class uh, official for a critical organization seeking to give uh, some sanity and predictability to what happens with nuclear testing and arms control and disarmament more generally. Over to you, Lucina. Thank you, <coughs> Kevin. And uh, thanks to my uh, fellow panelists and to the Munich Security Conference for uh, bringing the CTBT at least on the plate by having me uh, in this panel. Uh, first of all, I will focus on the DPRK, as Kevin mentioned, because that's, uh, uh, part, that's what I'm paid for. But I cannot focus on the DPRK without mentioning uh, the US-China relation that uh, many of my uh, fellow panelists have talked about. When we talk about DPRK or we talk about Asia Pacific, uh, I've heard uh, you've all mentioned uh, strategic dialogue between uh, US and China. But I want to move from US and China to later Russia when we move from the region to the overall the international uh, peace and stability that we're seeking. But why am I saying this? Because none of my fellow panelists as mentioned as a possible platform, the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, as a dialogue between US and China in the North Korean issue. The reason why I'm saying this is simple. When, what is the common denominator in the region between China, US, and North Korea? China and US are part of the CTBT. They've signed it. They're funding the CTBT. They're participating in our work but they haven't ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for a reason. 
But we're working closely with them to get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty ratified. If we had the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in force, we wouldn't be talking about North Korea testing today or North Korea developing nuclear weapon capability. Or if we were, we'll have an enforcement mechanism through the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty in force. And that's an important element that we should take in the security of the Korean Peninsula in Asia Pacific. And I'm saying this when I link it to Russia. Russia has signed and ratified the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. I mean, in the current discussion that I've been listening to, that's one positive aspect that we can see of Russia with regard to arms control and non-proliferation. What I'm offering is let's not lose sight of the fact that the DPRK move, has moved from 2006 six by testing, and then many people felt... No, those, they're joking. It's not a serious test because it was kind of a failed test in 2006. And we had experts like Zig Hecker at Stanford who have been saying, hey guys, let's take them seriously because I visited North Korea several times, talk about Zig Hecker from Stanford. And then we went to 2009, but 2006, they announced the day before that they would test, and they did it. 2009, they announced a couple of hours before, and then they did it. Then you go 2013, yes, they did announce an hour before, and then they did it. Then we move into 2016, they did it, and then they talk about it two hours later. But when they were talking about it, I had a joke in my office where I took a screenshot of CNN when they were talking about possible earthquake in the region and that people should identify, and then a couple of, uh, later, they talk about an explosion. But it is because you have a comprehensive test ban treaty and its international monitoring system that you have an institution that gives the credibility, the legitimacy to any detection of any event in the Korean Peninsula and beyond. The question we should ask, what if the CTBT and its international monitoring system were not in place today? You will have a handful of countries talking about a possible event in the Korean Peninsula and then people asking themselves, what is this event? And then if they say, no, it's uh, Japan or Korea or South Korea who is talking about the test, why should we believe them? We believe in the international legitimacy that an institution that is paid by all of you is giving to specific technical aspects of an event that happened in the Korean Peninsula. Because this is your achievement, we should use it in the dialogue as a possible platform for dialogue between China, US, and Korea in that peninsula and beyond that region go to Russia because we need this treaty in force to stop what is happening in North Korea or we need to bring at least North Korea to come to the table as an observer to discuss this issue for them to stop testing. We can be talking denuclearization, we can be talking sanction, but while we're doing sanction, North Korea is continuing testing and the more tests they do, the more they get closer to the nuclear weapon capability. And that's the question that we should ask ourselves today. Why we had India and Pakistan doing only, if I say only, I shouldn't say this, but some have done hundreds. They've done six tests, and they're considered nuclear power country today. And then we want to assume that with five tests, North Korea is not closer. For me, they're much closer than the international community can think of. So it's about time that we use the platform that we have, the arms treaty that we have in place to push them and not create new issues, that's what is happening. Because while we're creating in that region new issues, there are new issues elsewhere in the developing world. I can take Africa, Latin America, where there's a movement towards a, ban, a, a, test, a, a weapon ban treaty that is now to be discussed in March at the uh, in, in New York. And then when you look at this, the weapon countries seem to be not in sync. And if they're not in sync, we're putting ourselves in a situation where we have to look for what works and what brings people together. And this is what I'm advocating. Let's use the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, something that we started a long time ago. We're running a marathon. We're probably 350 meters before we end this long marathon. Let's use it as a platform to create a discussion with the North Korean, with mutual respect, and then see, I know it's difficult when we talk about dial dialogue with North Korea. But the comprehensive plan of action, consultative plan of action in Iran has shown that still multilateralism can do something. Let's do that in Korea and let's try to have that reverberate for the international community for more peace and stability. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Lucina Zebo. And a great reminder of an uh, infrastructure that's been developed around the world literally over the last decade or so uh, in terms of a comprehensive global network of monitoring um, so that uh, doubt at least on that question is removed and a call to both our Chinese and American friends to proceed to ratification and to reinforce the treaty architecture which exists and was the subject of enormous negotiations over almost a decade. Having listened to all these presentations, what I thought we'd do is this. We're at the halfway point. We have an hour to go. Um, and so I, was, I sense from the uh, comments made by the panellists that there are two big thematics which have emerged here. Uh, one is a uh, future trajectory of US-China relations and how it can be uh, sustained, how we can avoid any unnecessary conflict, and how it could, in fact, be improved. The other one, which has, uh, I think, permeated most of the conversations, uh, presentations, I should say, is how we deal with the North Korean nuclear challenge. If there's time, I might go to a third, which is, uh, the, um, which is the question of, um, of uh, the South China Sea. But in this period, what I'd like to do is to capture some questions um, on uh, US-China, um, and some observations, uh, some statements from uh, the assembled throng, and then turn that into a conversation for the next 20 minutes or so, and then move to the question of North Korea more specifically, and do it in that sequence rather than have a series of random observations about uh, things in general and nothing in particular, perhaps. So, US-China, if that's okay with my panellists, let's have a look at that for a while, uh, and then I'll bring some questions, uh, statements from the audience, and then I'll come back to panellists to comment and reflect. I see in the audience we've also got um, the Vice Foreign Minister of Japan, uh, Mi Vice Minister Odawara. Uh, over to you first, my friend. And uh, you're about to be given a microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rudd, for uh, giving me an opportunity to speak up. I'm Kyoshi Odawara, uh, Parliamentary Vice Minister for Foreign Affairs of Japan. It's, um, our, uh, it's my pleasure to participate in this session, and I very much enjoyed uh, the informative discussions on various issues uh, surrounding East, uh, East Asia. As a member of the countries of the uh, East Asia, I would like to briefly make comments from Japan's point of view um, faci to facilitating further uh, discussion in the panel. Um, yesterday, uh, in Bonn, uh, Foreign Minister Kishida had a bilateral meeting with China, ROK, and a trilateral meeting with uh, US and ROK. As discussed in those meetings, North Korea is an urgent threat to the security in East Asia. They recently launched a ballistic missile on the uh, 12th this month. Uh, it's been uh, representing the new level of threat while closely coordinating um, with the uh, United States, the ROK, and other countries concerned, and also cooperating with China. Uh, Japan will continue urging North Korea to refrain from any provocations and comply with the uh, relevant UN Security Council resolutions and other international commitments. Especially the ROK is Japan's neighbor and partner with which we, are, we share strategic interest. Now is the time for us to work together and cooperate to deter North Korea's reckless provocations. In addition, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that abduction by North Korea are an issue concerning the sovereignty as well as lives and safety for citizens. Under such severe security environment, Japan will play even more proactive role for the peace and stability and of the region. Japan and US share a lot in common. One of the things we share is the Pacific Ocean. Engagement of the US is absolutely imperative in order to maintain the security of the Asia Pacific region. The unshakable Japan-US alliance is the uh, cornerstone of peace, prosperity, and freedom in the region. In this regard, Prime Minister Abe and U.S. President Donald Trump confirmed last week 
that we will further strengthen the bond of the United States and Japan alliance, and that the two countries will play leading roles for assuring peace and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific region. Moreover, with the uh, Japan-US alliance at the center, it is important to reinforce uh, trilateral cooperation such as Japan-US ROK, Japan-US Australia, and Japan-US India. Furthermore, Japan is going to build up a, a mutual trust between China and Russia. When we discuss regional security, global perspective is essential. The key to stability and prosperity of the international community is the dynamism, dynamism created by the synergy between the, sorry, between the two continents, Asia and Africa, and two oceans, the Pacific and Indian Ocean. In order to secure peace and stability in the region, we have to enhance the connectivity of Indo-Pacific, the engine of the world, and to make the region more free and open. In this regard, maritime security is a key issue. It's indisputable that rule of law at sea is critically important. Japan will continue assisting capacity building in the developing countries for the purpose of carrying through the principle of the rule of law at sea. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Oruwara san Now, uh, we have ranged uh, far and wide in the comments uh, just given by our Japanese vice, minister, vice ministerial colleague. Um, I think, um, given that uh, you let off with North Korea in your remarks, if it's okay with the panel, let's go to the North Korea question in the uh, Q&A first, and then we'll come back to US-China. I think that's probably the best way. So, uh, any further questions and comments on North Korea and the North Korean uh, nuclear program? Sir, to you. If we can pass the microphone over. Thank you very much, Matthias Nastizait. My question is about North Korea. Uh, the Foreign Minister of South Korea described that we are close to a tipping point, as he called it. Uh, we have tried sanctions. You have tried pressure. You indicate that you want to do more pressure. But so far, the sanctions, the pressure has come to no avail. My question is, and this is directed both to your Foreign Minister and to the Senator, what, what do you intend to do now? Uh, the, the Chinese foreign minister yesterday said there is two possibilities, dialogue and confrontation. Are we getting close to confrontation? Or to be more precise, um, you both described we are close to a development of an workable ICBM. And President Trump said very closely in one of his famous treat, tweets, it won't happen. Senator, what does it mean, it won't happen? Well, let me put it this way. I might uh, turn quickly to Foreign Minister Yun, given it's a good and sharp question for your comments, and then Senator Sullivan, if that's okay with you. Uh, thank you very much very, uh, for your very good question. Actually, uh, the, as I mentioned that in my uh, opening remarks, uh, sanctions are not for the sanctions' sake. Basically, these are aimed to induce or force North Korea to come to the uh, the nuclearization talks. But because North Korea cheated and reneged upon so many times, uh, our message is that uh, we have to be very careful for coming back to the uh, talks, uh, especially when North Korea is now accumulating a lot of uh, fissile materials. As, is, as it stands now, they may have uh, around several dozens of uh, nuclear weapons uh, worth uh, plutonium or HEU. Uh, so uh, already they possess a lot of uh, dangerous uh, weapons capability. So uh, unless we stop and reverse this process now, uh, we are dealing with a country which has much more dangerous capacity than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. So simply talking about dialogue, or we coming back to the conference table uh, means nothing because now we have to, uh, we have to work very closely uh, in, uh, in, in compli I mean, in implementing this very precious UN Security Council resolutions that united the international community as a whole. Thanks very much, uh, Foreign Minister. Um, Senator, we'll keep this short and sharp and interactive. Well, thank you, and I, I first want to just, uh, to the vi Vice Minister, uh, thank you for your, your statement, and um, 
your emphasis on the importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance, I, I couldn't agree more with, as I mentioned in my open, opening remarks, is uh, critical to literally dealing with every issue, including the North Korea issue, which of course is a very difficult issue. It's very challenging and, um, uh, you know, the President Obama had this policy that they called a strategic patience. Um, I'm not sure that that worked. As a matter of fact, I think most people are viewing that now as a failed policy. Uh, I would look at three possibilities that uh, we need to look at very hard in dealing with North Korea. One is in enhanced missile defense. So we are working closely with the uh, South Korean government on the THAAD deployment. And that is a focus on protecting our troops and their troops in the region. And uh, we think that's important, uh, again, for the stability of the peninsula and the region. Second, although sanctions have not worked, um, the U.S. Senate and the Congress passed a sanctions bill last year that actually has the possibility of secondary sanctions, which is a uh, kind of ramping up the sanctions uh, equation. And I think that um, although, again, in the past that has not worked, it seems like the North Korean regime can be sanctioned, you know, all day and all night and is still moving forward on its path. Uh, that is another area that I think we need to look at. When I've talked about missile defense, I'm also talking about U.S. homeland missile defense to uh, bolster our own missile defense because it, this is public testimony from our military officers. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when that North Korea is going to be able to range the continental United States. Uh, they're almost very close to being able to range Alaska right now. So this isn't just a regional issue. This has become a global issue in terms of the threat. And finally, you know, I do think, and there's a number of people in the United States, myself included, who would encourage China, who has a lot of leverage over North Korea, to use that leverage in a more uh, constructive way to try to get them to uh, move back from the destabilization, de destabilizing activities that they're clearly undertaking now. So these are three areas that I think we can focus on in the immediate future. Could I turn to um, Chairman Fu Ying for a quick uh, response on um, what the Senator has just said, plus more broadly on THAAD. Uh, um, and then I'm going to go to Robin Niblett after that from Chatham House. A thought on THAAD, um, Senator, is as someone who said to me earlier today, THAAD of itself, ballistic missile defense systems, tends to concede the point that the North Korean nuclear program is now unstoppable. Um, and uh, and uh, I'd like your thoughts on that as well, and then I'll go straight to Ambassador Fu Ying. I, I don't think so. As a matter of fact, I would disagree with that. I think enhanced missile defense, whether THAAD or whether in the United States or with regard to uh, the missile defense of Japan, actually can help um, stabilize the situation because you don't, it, it, can bring, it can bring people back from the edge. Meaning if you believe that you have the ability, if North Korea actually launched a missile with a nuclear weapon on it, and you believe you have a very, very high probability of shooting that down and protecting your, your country, your people, whether on the Korean Peninsula or in Japan or in the United States, I think, I think it actually buys time. I think it's a stabilizing factor, but a very important factor. If you don't have that protection at all, the desire to actually do something in terms of a confrontation or a strike, I think actually grows. So I think the uh, missile defense, whether on the Korean Peninsula with THAAD, uh, what we're doing with Aegis destroyers, in, in cooperation, by the way, with the Japanese, or uh, homeland missile defense in the United States, is uh, stabilizing with regard to a very challenging national security issue. Fuying, if you were uh, the South Korean Defense Minister, how would you respond to current uh, security circumstances? From a South Korean perspective, is that a reasonable approach? Uh, your thoughts on that and Chinese leverage on the North? You mean South Korean Defense Minister? If you were the South Korean, did I say something else? Oh. <laughs> It's putting yourself in the shoes of the other. 
not Foreign Minister Yoon, he doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, I think uh, uh, we, we all, could, could we, could we step, uh, slip in the shoes of North Korea a bit? Uh, see, uh, the, 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 the concern about the Korean nuclear issue is high. We sh I, sh I share that. I think for China it's a huge concern. Um, but the solution we've heard around, uh, for example, Ambassador Yun hopes that there will be domestic changes in North Korea and unification. But you said it's a tipping. The, it doesn't look like uh, those things will happen before the tipping reaches uh, the, the point you wouldn't be able to bear. And the start, uh, start uh, it's, it's really a let it be attitude. Uh, and for China, that is like uh, many in China feels like being being uh, stabbed by your your uh, your friend, your partners. It's, uh, uh, it goes uh, see uh, if n the South Koreans are concerned of the North Korean threat, the convention conventional threat is already quite formidable. Both, both of you to each other. And, uh, and the SAD does technically does not help South Korea that much. I think, uh, uh, but it concerns China and Russia at the strategic level, you all understand it. And for, for I think uh, for, for, for us, we need to ask why the North Korean want to develop nuclear weapons. Do they want to throw it to Alaska? They know the, 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 they won't suffer, this, uh, they won't stand the second strike. They, the, according to the North Koreans, they wanted to feel safe. And uh, my question to all of you is that, uh, I know you, 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 no one in this room likes this, uh, agrees with this regime, I, I share that feeling, but does that country deserve a security at all? And uh, if, uh, we, don't, we, we all think North Korea does not deserve security, and that country is going to try by every means to find some kind of security, and there's no end of this problem. If we think it does, then we have to address that issue. That's why the Chinese foreign minister said we should talk, because this uh, strategic patience, which means a sanction and military pressure without talking, is not working, because the North Koreans have uh, tested four times during Obama's administration. So if you don't want the clock keep on ticking, you have to come back and see if you could talk with them and to find a solution to address their concern. The security in, in, in North Asia, if it's a bucket, this is the lowest uh, blank. If you don't try to, to, to mend it, the water is going to flow out from there. Thanks so much, Fui. I might go quickly to Robin Niblett from uh, Chatham House, and then I might turn to this general question. Well, hypothetically, if there were negotiations which were direct, what should be on the table or what could be on the table? Robin Niblett. Fortunately, um, Ambassador Fuying didn't answer the second part of your question, uh, Kevin. Um, it was just reported, I think, a few hours ago that China's imposed a total ban on imports of North Korean coal through the end of 2017. And uh, obviously this is North Korea's main export and China is its main uh, market. So it led me to want to ask the question to Ambassador Fu whether actually China is trying to find ways to apply pressure of the sort that the US and others have applied. And therefore, what is the Chinese approach to the kind of pressure that should be applied now that the threat is escalating and you'd rather people weren't doing things like that and so on? Over to you, for you. Just to f follow up, I, I think China has been abiding by the sanctions. Uh, China has been going along with the US uh, thinking and the South Koreans uh, thinking, but China keeps on reminding you only sanctions, only military pressures, without talks, it's not going to solve the problem. And uh, the coming military exercises in, in March is going to provoke more tension. And China just keep on telling you this is not working, although we're going along with you. But uh, you have to realize that without talking with them, 
you will only drive them in the wrong direction further. So the point there being additional leverage, a quick intervention from you, Foreign Minister Yun. China is applying leverage, uh, as Robert Niblett just reminded us, but scepticism within Beijing as to what actually the end point is in terms of producing a result, Foreign Minister Yun. Maybe uh, for your uh, easy understanding, uh, let me uh, explain about uh, what is uh, what Saad is about. Actually, last week uh, we saw uh, this IRBM launch by North Korea. It is very sophisticated missile, and uh, if they uh, launch this kind of IRBM in a very high angle, they could land in the southern part of South Korea. But right now, we do not have any. Uh, any uh, defensive measures to address this kind of missile. So what we need is to have some kind of multiple layers of our defense because we only have Patriot missile. But this time, the speed of this uh, incoming missile is too fast. So South is very relevant to defending us against this kind of a threat. But what is most important is this. This is, uh, this is only targeting uh, the North Korea. And this is only on the terminal mode, not forward-based mode. Forward-based mode is just uh, forward-based mode is the uh, something like uh, you know more offensive use, but terminal mode is just for defensive mode. And this kind of radar is only used for North Korea. So when uh, chairperson who mentioned strategic, uh, I think you, if you say uh, if there is any military threat from this uh, system, that is not correct. That is, it is not a fact. Uh, so I think uh, this is why we are suggesting to our Chinese friends that it's better for us to have engage in some kind of either bilateral dialogue or trilateral dialogue among Korea, USA, and China to clarify what's the problem. Because on our part, we do not pose any threat with this deployment of South, ba South battery system. Uh, regarding uh, this, uh, the another question, I think uh, uh, the the whole the. Uh, the problem of South uh, deployment is because there is the most imminent, the gravest th threat from North Korea. So the question is not question, uh, the, the real, po real point is not to question the deployment of South, but how to press and persuade North Korea uh, to <coughs> abandon nuclear weapons and missile program. That is the key question. Thanks, Prime Minister. I'm going to go back to the audience now. We're still on North Korea, folks. Uh, gentleman here in uh, the red tie. Nope, up in front here, that's right. And then I'm gonna go back and over here. Two or three comments from the audience and back to the panel, then I'll try to bring this part of the conversation towards a close, sir. Hi, I'm uh, Alexander Vershbaugh. I'm a former NATO Deputy Secretary General, but a long time ago, Ambassador to South Korea. And uh, first of all, on THAAD, uh, the Chinese case, as, as is the same thing for the Russian case against NATO missile defense, is based on zero facts. It's a defensive system. It has a limited range. It cannot affect in the slightest Chinese deterrent forces, which are aimed at the United States, which go over the North Pole. It has zero capability. So this is an artificial issue being prom promoted, I think, just to put pressure on South Korea. But on the uh, b deeper issue that we're talking about, uh, I was disturbed that Madame Fu seemed to be justifying North Korea's uh, deployment of nuclear weapons. Uh, if they feel insecure, they've had a path to a peaceful solution, one could look particularly at the 2005 joint statement, which calls for a peace regime, a final ending of the Korean War through a, through a not just an armistice, but a peace treaty, which could provide all kinds of security guarantees. Uh, but they've continued to spurn that uh, because then they have abandoned their commitment uh, from earlier years to denuclearization as the ultimate goal of talks. If they take denuclearization out of the equation, uh, they're the ones that are posing the threat to stability on the Korean Peninsula. And with this uh, tweet by President Trump that it ain't going to happen, uh, there is now at least the possibility of preemptive action, which would be bring potential for wider conflict on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, does China really want that? You seem to be more interested in stability of the regime than stability on the, the, the North Korean regime than stability on the, on the Korean Peninsula. The sobering words of pre preemptive action have been uttered in the room, um, as has the question of a, um, what in fact a peace negotiation might look like. And I'll come back to that one in a minute. Sir, over to you. I'm 
thank you for the chance. I'm participating in this conference as the member of the 2017 Munich Young Leader Program. Good so my question is also about that, but like a different part of what just discussed here. The Chinese government has made it clear of many times that the deployment, deployment of that would undermine the regional strategic balance. It sounds to me that maintaining a status quo is the strategic balance China pursues. To be clear, I, wanna, I would like to ask the Vice Minister Fu Ying how China defined the, the regional strategic balance to be destabilized or destroyed by that, deplo that deployment. And I'm also wondering whether the US government, the Senator Dan Sullivan, is willing to share or agree to that definition. In my opinion, like uh, living with nuclear armed North Korea is not something of strategic balance. The people in Korea, Japan, even China, and other Asian countries would like to accept. Okay, preemption, peace negotiations, peace treaty, regional strategic balance, how defined and how generally accepted. Over there, sir. Thank you, European Parliament, former Foreign Defense Minister of Latvia. I have a question to um, Madame uh, Chairwoman Fu Ying. Um, at the beginning of your uh, initial presentation, you mentioned that it's uh, very helpful in Munich Security Conference to see the other angle, how Europeans think about Asia security issues. I indeed uh, agree with you in that sense, and we have a certain, I would say, unclarity uh, among many my colleagues in European Parliament and also in national governments uh, regarding uh, uh, China, um, South China Sea policy, because looking from our region here in Europe, once we have uh, disputed areas, we usually engage in uh, dialogue and we follow up um, the international decisions and we do not uh, intend any unilateral moves because this is basically provoking always other side. We know it from our own regions. So uh, we know that there have been the ruling of international court. Now we also heard that uh, very high ranking Chinese leadership in Davos and also yesterday in Munich Security Conference was uh, rightly presenting uh, China as uh, or China's uh, ambitions to be a world leader uh, and to stick to international rules. How does these two things actually go together? For many of our colleagues, it seems a little bit contradictory. Uh, I would be happy to hear your comment. Okay. I might bring that into the broader discussion about US-China as we get into the next session, because that does go to global order questions. So anyone else on North Korea? Last calls? Good. We're going back, back to the panel. So the three outstanding points I have from the floor are uh, one, um, and this is a very difficult subject to discuss, but it's been put on the table, which is if all else fails, and given President Trump's tweet, are we looking at a world of possible preemptive action? Um, secondly, if that was to be avoided, and this I think is a very open discussion, which Foreign Minister Yoon may not fully approve of, but if there were hypothetically, hypothetically discussions, open discussions involving the North, uh, the South, uh, China and the United States about a peace agreement comprehensively with denuclearization, many other side of the argument, what would be on the table or what could be on the table? And finally, the specific question about uh, regional strategic balance. Now, Ambassador Fu, you've been in the middle of all those questions. Uh, you can go later or go earlier. What would you prefer to do? <laughs> go first. Uh, uh, first, I, I want to ask, uh, I want to talk about the question of the justification. Uh, I think in, in the international relationship, uh, in my ex experience as a developing country, uh, coming from uh, uh, less experience on the international stage, my observation is that the countries uh, react to each other. Uh, reaction, mm, action invites reaction, and reaction invites further reaction. So 
uh, for, for countries uh, to deal with each other, it's always important to have some kind of empathy, try to understand why the other side thinks that way or does things the way they, 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 the way they, it does. Uh, and uh, for the Korean nuclear issue, uh, I think many probably in China would regret that 2002 we agreed with the U.S. invitation to get involved. <laughs> 2002 uh, uh, was when the framework agreement between U.S. and uh, North Korea uh, came to fail. And uh, the the framework agreement, which was signed in uh, 1994, was without China's participation, without South Korea's participation. It was solely negotiated between the United States and North Korea because it was a problem between the two of them. And at that time, I think the United States accepted that the North Korea had a security concern and they had an agreement that was addressed. And the North Korean agreed to abandon the nuclear program and the United States promised to offer them to light water uh, uh, power plants and some uh, heavy oil, but didn't work. Neither side delivered. In 2002, United States came, Secretary Paul, Colin Powell came to China. I remember clearly that he hoped that the China would uh, mediate over the issue because they couldn't trust each other. And uh, he, he came uh, February 2002, and uh, you remember uh, March 2002, United States started war on Iraq. And obviously, United States wanted China to, to help uh, calm, calming down the Korean nuclear issue. And since then, China has been uh, mediating and it's interesting that 10 years later, many, th many people think that it's China's problem. It's China's responsibility. But uh, when you talk about justification, as a mediator, we, uh, we tried very hard to understand every party's justification of their position. And that's, that's the role of the mediator. We have to understand why they think that way and then try to meet the middle, try, try to narrow the middle ground. And the most successful agreement was made 2005. And it was, uh, was quite, as you, as you mentioned, it was quite near to a peace accord. And uh, 60 years after the end of the war, there was still no peace accord. It's a very, very strange situation. And, uh, and it was very hopeful that they, they, could, they could do it. But then, right after the agreement, right after the agreement 2005, the United States found a problem at the bank of uh, of a Hui, Hui Ye in Macau. And they started uh, financial sanctions. And after three rounds of financial sanctions, you, you North Korea <coughs> withdrew from the talks and went on with their first nuclear testing. Can okay, I interrupt so just there for one second? Go back to quickly to 2005 and the agreement itself, as you think it could have happened. What was on the table? Was everything on the table? Yeah, and right, and right. give me the elements of what was on yes. the table. I, I, let me see. I, I have, I have, hope we ha I have the things. I think they agreed. I think the North Koreans Peace was treaty? going to. Mm. North Koreans, I don't have this in details. I think the North Koreans were agreed to abandon, practically, and the uh, and the uh, United States agreed to. I don't have the in details. As you could check. As, as I, I recall, I've you had a long article. You had, I you had uh, denuclearization or non-nuclearization by the North Koreans on one side of the agenda. And on the other side of the agenda, and the other side of the negotiation, it was uh, moving from uh, where we are at the moment, which is an armistice, to a peace treaty. Uh, and then there are other provisions as well in terms of um, uh, economic development of North Korea, political relationship between North and South. Foreign Minister Yoon, can you help me there? Yes, as you, as you said, uh, there are uh, five or six elements, but you covered already uh, the, uh, the, uh, in, in that agreement. But I think... Uh, the, uh, I'll give you some of uh, the uh, actual facts why all these previous agreements failed. In well, first of all, just give us the guts of what was, what I'm interested in is can you actually, if in this current environment with President Trump, where the possibility has been openly discussed in Washington at present that previous approaches have failed, maybe it is time to throw things onto the table, and I know that's not the position of the ROK government, but I'm interested in to know what was alive in terms of a comprehensive deal back then which may be relevant today. 
Okay, just to then I'll focus on one thing, peace regime. Actually, in that uh, agreed, uh, September 19th agreement, uh, we have five elements. Uh, one of them is uh, peace, peace regime agreement. At the time, the whole idea of this peace regime is that uh, if we are making substantial progress in denuclearization, then we, are, we could have some kind of a peace regime talk in a separate forum among four parties, US, South and North Korea, and China. But the problem is that uh, in 1990s, late 1990s, we tried this approach already among four parties. At the time, what North Korea demanded for two years is the withdrawal of US forces from Korea. They didn't uh, pay any attention to real peace. So that failed. And uh, if we start peace talks at this stage, when North Korea has no intention to abandon the nuclear weapons, that means uh, these nuclear talks, denuclearization talks, will be simply a hostage or peace talk because there is no commitment on the part of North Korea to giving up those, uh, those nuclear weapons. So I think uh, we are, in that case, that we'll be uh, uh, coming into the uh, big black hole. You know, this is why uh, we are asking uh, all these six party members to uh, ask for the uh, real genuine commitment on the part of North Korea to abandoning these nuclear weapons. Thanks so much. And uh, just if you could conclude on this um, uh, for you. Very quick run of the uh, 2005 agreement. Uh, first, the North Koreans, for the first time, formally uh, committed to re renounce all its nuclear weapons and nuclear weapon programs. And the South Korean, for the first time, also indicated it would not develop nuclear weapons. And second point it is that the uh, U.S. has agreed to discuss at the time appropriate light water uh, power plants. And third, U.S. and Japan agreed to normalize relations with North Korea. And four, U.S. and Japan agreed not to e have uh, economic sanctions against uh, <laughs> North Korea. There was no mentioning, there wasn't any, any mentioning of the troops. And uh, Japan and U.S. would also be interested in providing energy assistance. And South Korea committed uh, 200 kilowatts uh, power assistance program. And the first, for the first time, there was a discussion about uh, a peninsula peace uh, regime. Thank so you. it was, a, it was a quite- It was fairly forward reaching. It was fairly comprehensive. Very, Defense Minister Ong, you've been very quiet on this one. Before I move to US China, do you have any reflections from the advantage of Southeast Asia and Singapore about where North Korea, the North Korean negotiation or non-negotiation could go now? Uh, I wouldn't venture into the territory. I think there are enough experts here and uh, we, we draw solace from the fact that we are some distance away and we hope that you solve the problem before they can develop the capability. No, I, I have nothing to so add. So keep, keep, keep the uh, microphone there, Defence Minister. We won't let you off the hook completely because I'm now flipping to the broader question of US-China. And uh, in your comments before, you quite rightly saw this as the, the pivotal question uh, for the future of uh, wider strategic stability in the Asia-Pacific region. Uh, if you were looking at the reality now of what President Trump has on the table in terms of where he wants uh, the US-China relationship to go, his outstanding concerns on trade, on currency, and on uh, the questions of the South China Sea and North Korea, and given China's uh, view uh, that uh, the US may say it's engaging China, but de facto through four deployments it continues to contain China, do you, where do you see the intersecting sets of national interests lying which could form the basis uh, for a more stable relationship between the two in the current political circumstances? I think we'll have to first differentiate uh domestic pressures that President Trump was uh, responding to in his presidential campaign and uh, the promises he made during them. Uh, separate from what exactly happens uh, after that, so if I take security for instance, uh, I think the very fact of the US presence, uh, US Pacific Command, the deployment of ships will continue and that will give assurance. I think Vice President Pence's uh, reassurance for NATO 
And uh, when I met Secretary Mattis, his reassurance that Asia remains a top priority uh, gives, uh, if you like, reassurance to uh, America's uh, allies and partners. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I have said that if U.S.'s efforts are seen as uh, or perceived or on the ground perceived as anti-China, then I think it will uh, be a frustrating decade for us. And uh, Kevin, you rightly asked where are the points or the common ground where we can intersect. Uh, I think that the American foreign policy in Asia cannot be predicated on security concerns alone. And that's where I completely agree with Senator Dan Sullivan, that one of the primary measures that the US can do is to reinv re reinvigorate your own economy. Uh, the TPP, unfortunately, was an instrument in which uh, US could have uh, asserted and even uh, stimulated its economic presence in Asia. Uh, we take it as its, as at its current form, it's probably dead. Uh, but I think there are still avenues, whether it's uh, RCEP plus or whether it's a TPP minus with the uh, US subsequently entering. I think it's important for us because, as you know, the TPP meant 12 countries in aggregate forming 40% of GDP. And in, in Singapore's view, uh, we started it because there were political uh, realities that you couldn't put both together. But the TPP and RCEP, the grand design that at some point in the near future would be combined. So I, I would summarize by saying that the common ground is trade. Uh, secondly, there are security issues, and in, uh, Madam Fuing rightly mentioned uh, the security architecture. And what would be from the non-allies points of view, uh, US non-allies point of view, and inclusive architecture. And that's what we've been doing for the last decade for ADMM and ADMM Plus. So I think there are enough platforms. I think we, we, we really have to continue this. There won't be any silver bullet. But uh, I think if there are enough political will and enough bright minds and good leadership that are brought to bear, we can avoid uh, any unnecessary conflict. Thank you so much, uh, Defence Minister. Senator Sullivan, your thoughts on the future of US-China. Where could it go? Where are the possible points of intersection, given all the difficulties which exist at the moment? Well, I, I think um, one thing you're seeing is, you know, there's obviously you, you have a new administration coming on board. Um, by the way, as a senator, I'm, you know, my, I have a constitutional role to provide advice and consent to essentially uh, either agree or disagree to the members of the cabinet that the president is putting forward. And on his national security cabinet, it's a very strong cabinet, I would say, with General Mattis as the Secretary of Defense, with Rex Tillerson as Secretary of State, uh, with uh, General Kelly as a Homeland Security uh, Secretary. So there's what I think you're starting to see, and I think that the focus of General Mattis's, Secretary Mattis's first trip, which was to Korea and Japan, goes to this issue of focusing on our allies, but there's also the issue of trying to bring stability. I thought it was very important at the day that uh, um, President Trump met with Prime Minister Abe, which was an important and successful visit. Just last week, he reiterated the One China policy, which was also, as you mentioned, Mr. Prime Minister, a recognition of the importance of continuity on that which eight previous presidential administrations had committed to. So that's important. You know, there's been a lot of questions on the South China Sea. In some ways, you know, we view that as the continuity of what we've been doing in the region for decades. If you look at the founding documents of the United States, the Declaration of Independence, the U.S. Constitution, freedom of navigation, freedom of the seas is a core national interest that has existed since the founding of our country. And we have 
provided, as I said earlier, open lines of transportation and, and commerce for the Asia Pacific countries, including China, for decades, and it's benefited everybody. So, um, Madam Fu Ying, when you mentioned that there was provocations and tensions in 2012, we saw those provocations and tensions being from a dramatic militarization of the region, primarily by China. So, what we intend to do in that region, what I think our allies, I think, are supportive of is what we've said, what President Obama said. What I believe President Trump will continue to focus on is we're going to fly, sail, and transit anywhere international law allows in that critical part of the world. And um, the earlier question about uh, the dismissiveness of the Chinese leadership with regard to the Hague decision um, is somewhat concerning. So we intend to continue to do that. We hope to do that with allies, like Australia or Japan or Korea or others. But I think regular fawn ops with allies is what we need to do in that region. But it's not different for us. Fawn ops, That's freedom of navigation, freedom of navigation yes, operations. Sir. Getting a little militaristic here on my acronyms. But that's a continuation of what the United States has been doing for decades. The change, from my perspective, is the facts on the ground are changing due to the militarization of some of these um, reefs and islands that, in my view, that's the thing that's causing the tension, not what the United States has been doing for decades, which, again, has benefited every country in the region, including China, in my view. And what can you do as the, as the administration on the positive side of the ledger as well? Um, the President Trump has said the problem with trade, there's a problem with the currency. On the economic agenda, uh, do you see an opportunity to make progress on those questions? Where would the commonalities lie there? Absolutely. So that's why I said in my opening remarks that my view with regard to our broader strategy on this critical issue of the engagement between the United States and China I mentioned the focus on allies, and I, I can't reiterate that enough. And you're seeing that with Secretary Mattis's first trip to Korea and Japan. Um, but there is plenty of areas of engagement uh, that I think we need to continue and to work through. When you have the dialogue, when you have the meetings, when you have the engagement between whether it's senior administration officials or military officials or members of the legislature, it's helpful. I'll give you one example where I think there's enormous opportunity, energy. Um, right now, the United States is uh, one of our strategic advantages. We've become the world's energy superpower, again, largest producer of oil, again, largest producer of natural gas and LNG, again. We have the opportunity to trade with not only our allies, from my perspective, Japan and Korea, with regard to, say, for example, LNG, but with regard to China. And I've actually been over to China as an Alaskan official to try to engage with Chinese senior officials to deepen our energy relationship. So I think that there's opportunities clearly in the energy space. And um, the more engagement you have, obviously, the more opportunities you find where the opportunities lay. So that's one example. Thank you so much. Nuclear questions have been discussed in relation to uh, the question specifically of um, North Korea. And CTBO obviously has a huge role to play there. But more broadly, Lucina, on the question of US-China relations, um, North Korea and North Korea Plus, do you see the opportunity for a substantive and enhanced uh, nuclear non-proliferation dialogue between these two great powers? Thank you, uh, Kevin. Uh, I wanted to, uh, in, uh, you know, to answer this question, I want to go back to a question that came on what to do next after sanction and sanction. And uh, we heard about uh, possible preemptive action. And I have a question for both uh, Chairwoman Fu Ying and uh, uh, Senator Tillerson, and also Foreign Minister uh, he's, a, he's a Sullivan, not a Tillerson. Uh, sorry, That's okay. <laughs> Sullivan. That's he, the Secretary Sullivan. of State. Secretary of State, no. Uh, Sullivan. Yeah, the promotion. Yeah, okay. okay. We I was about to say, I wouldn't say no, Senator, at this yeah. stage. Uh, 
if China, because if all the discussion went into China having the key to the solution on DPRK. If Madame Fuyi was coming and then saying, I'm putting on the table today a proposal whereby North Korea agree to stop testing or to stop any movement towards uh, further developing his nuclear capability and in exchange, uh, China get them, uh, China asked that from North Korea and then you are in a position where you are asked to postpone or stop the exercise, the military exercise that in what we read and all what they write or what they talk about is a threat to them. And Fu Ying talking about reducing threat and giving them more security. That's a question that I'm asking. That's something that could come on the table. What would you react to it? That's my first question. That's a big first question. Thank you for taking over the role as moderator. The, uh, it's okay, we're friends, I'm relaxed, I'm from Australia. Uh, the, um, who wants to have a go at that one? Well, I mean, my first reaction would be that would be a question not only for the United States, but for um, our allies, South Korea and Japan. So that, that, that to me is one of the key issues here. We will, we, in my view, we, we should not be making any decisions uh, that don't um, provide consensus with, uh, with our, our two key allies uh, on this issue in the region. So, um, you know, I would be just, the goal is a nuclear, is a nuclear uh, free peninsula. And unfortunately, the proposition that you just mentioned to me doesn't sound like you're getting there, particularly with a regime that doesn't necessarily have a good track record of keeping its word on much of anything. So I'm not sure I would give up military exercises, which are important for uh, something like that. But again, that wouldn't be a unilateral decision from the United States. That would be something that uh, we would obviously have to get consensus with our allies on. Thanks so much, Senator. We've got uh, about 10 minutes to run. I'm going to give each of the panelists a strict uh, 60 to 90 seconds to say their last bits at the end. Any final questions on US-China before we head into the summary session? The lady up the front, and then we'll come to some summaries. Then I might try and draw a few threads together in the remaining minute or two. Over to you. Shalal with Reuters. Um, Madam Fu, I wanted to ask You're you... from uh, Reuters? From Reuters, Thank yeah. You. Um, I wanted to ask um, you and, and also the other panelists about this issue of the sort of U.S.-Chinese uh, relationship. Do you, from your perspective, see it as important that you take action to um, press North Korea to work, you know, to, to release or to, to relinquish this nuclear program? And can you confirm this decision on the coal imports and explain how important you think that is or isn't? And then finally, to the senator, just a question about the deployment of THAAD. Would you think that it would be useful to deploy THAAD to Japan as well, given the concerns? There's been a trilateral statement now by the foreign ministers of um, South Korea, Japan, and um, um, and, uh, and, and the United States talking about each of them applying pressure. Um, is that a form of pressure that could be brought to bear? Okay, like a good Reuters uh, journalist, three questions in one, well done. Can I suggest that as we uh, roll through our panelists at the end and starting from you, Foreign Minister Yoon, you might bear those last questions in mind as you bring your summary remarks. And if I could ask you to keep it to a minute or two apiece and then we'll be able to finish on time and head to drinks and dinner. Over to you, Foreign Minister Yoon. So instead of uh, the concluding remarks, uh, I will uh, respond to some of the points raised by, by other panelists and uh, some questions. Actually, uh, the reason why the Geneva Agreed Framework failed is because North Korea cheated. They accumulated, they engaged in secret development of HEU programs. This is the major reason why they failed. The reason why 2005 joint statement failed is because they did not allow inspectors to see the facilities. That, that was the verification issue. The reason why 2013 
uh, the uh, leave day deal failed is because just one month after this agreement, North Korea launched the uh, long range missile. So every time they reneged, they cheated. This is why this time around we should not repeat the same old mistakes. Regarding this, uh, the very interesting proposal from my colleague, uh, Mr. Zerva, actually uh, stopping testing right now on the part of North Korea is the easiest option for them because already they have several dozens of nuclear weapons or weapons worth of fissile material. So they lose nothing. So what is required from the international uh, the, uh, community, the community is that uh, reverse this process and then get inspections. Not simply the moratorium of stopping nuclear testing because the situation is much worse and much serious than 10 years ago, 20 years ago. This is why we are talking about the full implementation of the UN Security Council resolutions. So until they show real commitment to relinquishing these nuclear weapons programs and giving us real signs in actions. Without actions, we cannot trust their rhetoric, their commitment. So rhetoric, commitment, and action should go together. This is very, very important. And uh, thank you very much, Kevin, for all these inter uh, interesting opportunities. Thanks so much, Foreign Minister Yoon. Uh, Defense Minister Ong. I thought I'd conclude my remarks by uh, picking off where Senator Sullivan and Madam Fui talked about. And she talked about two periods after 1990, uh, fall of the Berlin Wall and uh, what the US has done. And if you look at Asia, uh, how much and how far we've actually come as successful nations. And I would say that uh, the problems that we are having, uh, you know, rising power now, are actually manifestations of a successful American US foreign policy in the 70s. The question is, how do you move forward? And uh, Kevin, you asked where there's common ground. I think there's plenty of common ground. I think what is missing is not uh, the potential for cooperation, but leadership and a common cause between US and China. And I, I would be first to say, Singapore would be first to say that we benefit from the system of common rules, of respect for rule of law, and we look to leadership, both US and China, to improve that framework. So I'm optimistic that the Asian century, indeed, is starting to occur, will pick up pace. Uh, there are challenges, and this is an unpre unpredictable uh, period. But I'm optimistic that given good leadership, uh, clear-sighted vision, that uh, this will be a century for uh, continued Asian growth. Thanks so much, uh, Defence Minister Ng. Um, Fu Ying, you've been the woman in the hot seat all evening, so your concluding remarks. Uh, thank you. S there's so much I, I, I wanted to say. Uh, uh, first, about the Korean nuclear issue, uh, my, I feel more pessimistic uh, now than when I came into the hall. And I think, uh, I, I was there when Colin Paul was, came to China, asking China to, to help. And if he said what you said, uh, Don Solomon, Mr. Senator, China would never come in. China wouldn't have uh, come into the situation at all. So uh, I think uh, if we really want to address the issue, you mean because we need it would have been unsol unsolvable from your perspective, or why wouldn't you not? Right, come? right. Looks like, looks like whatever. Uh, I mean, I think in, to solve an issue, uh, it's important to hear one side of the story. It's also important to hear the other side of the story. Otherwise, you will never solve the problem. So th this is uh, this is the how how the world uh, works, but. Uh, I still hope, uh, uh, I hope the new U.S. administration would think that uh, talking is necessary and I still think there is a hope to come in and intervene before the, the, the problem goes in the wrong direction for too far. And about uh, one, one quick intervention about the arbitration. China, China did not think the arbitration was uh, fair and there was a, a list of the things China stated why China could not accept the arbitration. And it's also the right uh, given by the international law for countries to decide to choose how to solve disputes. So it doesn't mean that China does not respect international law. Uh, the, uh, 
and China to be, I think it's wrong to think that China wants to be the world leader, far from that. But China would like to uh, play, play more positive, uh, contribute more positively, to make more positive contributions to today's world, if China can, within its capabilities. But China-US relationship it has been healthy, uh, one of the most successful relationship, I, I think, and has grown into such a strong uh, uh, substantive uh, level. Uh, now, every f 17 minutes, there's a flight between our two countries. And the trade and personnel exchanges, everything have grown so strongly. So there's every reason that the two countries work out uh, their relationship. We've gone through many crises over the past uh, decades because of, the, because of the fact that the two countries would like to see a, a better relationship. We both think our relationship is important for us and the, uh, for the world as whole. And at this moment, if the new administration would like to focus on the economy, China warmly welcomes it, because that's the area China is familiar with. And we, could, uh, we should be able to solve our differences and move forward in a positive manner, in a way that both countries benefit. On the security front, it's a bit difficult. I think uh, uh, I, I fully understand why there is such a strong emphasis of the alignment. This is the pillar stone for, for, for you for years. But I think I would advise that uh, down the road, U.S. need to look a, a bit beyond the alignment because Asia Pacific, the world is bigger than alignment. There are many other countries beyond alignment. And it's okay when the interests are the same, if, but if the interests some members of your allies, some members of your alignment have a colliding interest with the other countries who are not your allies. You need to decide how to address those kind of conflicts. And in order to have a real, real security, as I said, common security, security cannot be achieved at the cost of others in today's world. Thank you. Thanks so much. And we're just heading over time now, so don't wish to cramp your style, Senator, but... Um, but well, I'll, I'll just make two points. Uh, I, I believe that um, obviously there's always a concern about what the new administration is going to do in any, in any case. But I, but I do believe that uh, you know, the Trump administration in Asia in the last few weeks has had a, has had a good start. The, the, visit, the first visit by Secretary Mattis was to Japan and Korea, important signal. Uh, the president reaffirmed uh, the one China policy, which I think was important from a stability perspective and continuity perspective. And uh, Prime Minister Abe had a very a successful visit. So I would say from a U.S., Japan, and Korea relationship right now, uh, it's very strong economically, militarily. But I'll just end by emphasizing uh, what I said at, at the outset. I think one of the most important things we can do for our policy in the region is approach it in, as a, in a confident way with um, particularly strong economic growth at home. Now here's an opportunity, and I've mentioned this to other Chinese officials that I've had contact with. You know, if you look at one, one example in the relationship between the United States and Japan, many years ago when the relations were very difficult on economic issues. One of the things that China, uh, Japan started doing was major greenfield investments in America. So I think Japan has, you know, um, employs as many American auto workers as the big three now, something very close. So one opportunity is uh, when China is looking at investing and the United States is looking at trying to really, really ramp up our own economic growth is those kind of opportunities. Greenfield foreign direct investment in America, the way we've done it in China for many years. I think these are the kind of opportunities that deepen engagement and can deepen cooperation. Certainly worked between the United States and Japan uh, a few decades ago, and uh, that's one area where there might be a silver lining here on deepening engagement. Last but by no least, but by no means least, Lucina Serbo. Thank you. Uh, I wanted to come back to uh, what Foreign Minister uh, Jung say, said. 
when he mentioned that North Korea would lose nothing in stopping testing, it takes me back to the discussion I had beginning of the week in Mexico uh, with the movement towards the weapon ban treaty. It's the same thing they're saying. They say, look, Mr. Zerbo, we understand the test ban treaty, but those countries, the weapon country, lose nothing in getting the CTBT into force today. <laughs> so we have to somehow play it universally. What we say that is not workable in South, it shouldn't be workable somewhere else. Because if we think, if we go to the assumption that stopping testing is basically losing nothing for those who have engaged already in the marsh or the progress towards developing nuclear capability, I think we're going the wrong direction because the perception will be in the South that, look, why should we even get the treaty into force? Why should we uh, uh, not ask directly a complete ban on nuclear weapon immediately, knowing that that's not a workable solution now unless the nuclear weapon country participate. That's the risk that I see there. The next point that I wanted to say with regard to the DPRK is, are we serious about not letting them acquiring a better weapon if we assume that they're not far from the first step of a nuclear weapon, because the question is often asked to the CTBT, can you tell us if it's a plutonium-based or a uranium-based test? But that's beside the point. The point is they're testing, and the more they test, the more they're getting capable, the more they're getting stronger. And one of the issues of the test ban treaty is, not, is to stop not only horizontal proliferation, but stop vertical for people who have it to not develop better weapon and more stronger weapon. So if we take that perspective, I think it is about time that we get on the table and get North Korea to stop testing as a first step towards denuclearization. I mean, I cannot ask more less than this because I'm the head of the CTBT. Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks, folks. Uh, on North Korea, a really good discussion. Uh, one, we're a couple of years before crossing the threshold. Two, will the current strategy work of sanctions and sanctions plus? And if not, can China do more to leverage the North Koreans like has just been indicated from the press reports on coal imports. Three, if it's not going to work, then what replaces it? Is there an alternative strategy uh, to go back to a creative re-rendition of 2005, of course, with complete and verifiable denuclearization on the North Korean side of the agenda, as well as the inducements in terms of peace and development on the peninsula? And if that doesn't work, are we into a world of preemption? And if we're going to not have preemption and nothing else works, are we prepared to live with a nuclear-armed and capable North Korea in the region? Those are the sobering questions emerging on that one. On US-China, I think um, Defence Minister Ong, your very first and challenging thought for the, for the day and for our good friends from the United States was, if it's just America first, what does Asia think about that, allied or non-allied? And I think that's a question for our American friends to reflect on, both in their declaratory and substantive policy. Uh, Fu Ying, inclusive or exclusive security architecture, allies and non-allies. What would the inclusive look like? ARF, EAS, or as Defence Minister Ung knows from my previous engagements on this question personally, um, an EAS plus, which actually does evolve a much greater common security forum involving all the countries of East Asia. And uh, what I have called, what I have called more broadly across the region, including the Southeast Asians, a long-term vision for an Asia-Pacific community anchored in common security. South China Sea, some very uh, direct observations from the Senator. We'll fly and sail, um, consistent with uh, our role in the world and keeping open the uh, sea lanes of, uh, of uh, communication and a continuation and expansion of FONOPS, uh, Freedom of Navigation Operations. Where will that go? And we're press reporting the last few days about possible changes to US naval ROEs. Um, worth watching. On the positive side of the agenda with US-China, economic cooperation, energy cooperation, FDI. But then it all comes back to, can these two actually cooperate on bring, producing the grand bargain on North Korea? And very finally from me, if all that's possible, What's the machinery for doing it uh, between Washington and Beijing? At present, it's a bit thin. Let's hope it gets better. Please congratulate this first-class panel.
And thank you, and thank you all for your participation and for Munich for putting this on.